All we do is go out to dinner. That's it? I mean, he picks up the tab every time, which is great. He's using you. He probably has a city thank you card and he gets two times the points at restaurants. Huh. The city thank you preferred card. Now earn two times the points on dining out with no annual fee. Go to city.com slash thank you cards. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Table 2, presented by City Thank You Preferred Card and Tasting Table. I'm Adam, Editorial Director of Tasting Table, and I'm very excited to bring you two times the guests today here. We have Chef Eric Rupert from Le Bernardin oh. and Chef Michael White of Morea here with us in Tasting Table's Test Kitchen and Dining Room. Thank you, Chef, so much for joining us. Thank you for having Thanks. us. Really. Thanks for coming. And for the past couple of weeks, we have been asking Tasting Table readers to submit their questions to Eric and Michael, uh, using the hashtag two times everywhere. And today we've got five of them joining us live for our conversation. So thank you guys for joining us. Let's get started talking a little bit. Um, if you're watching, please join in and submit any questions that you might have using the hashtag two times everywhere. So Eric, uh, I'll start with you. Uh, we drew first. You go first. Uh, you, Loretta Den has been open since 1986, right? But you joined later. Yes, they opened in 1986 in New York, in New York before right. in, in Paris, and then I came to the Bernardin in 1991. 91. So, what, so that's a good long time you've been in New York working in New York as a chef. What's, what's changed in the restaurant scene? Uh, what, how has it changed to be a chef in the city? Well, at the time, first of all, it was less competition. Yeah. Um, and in terms of products, you couldn't really find the quality product that we find today. Right. I'm not talking about the seafood necessarily because Gilbert Lecoz did, did, did a good job with the fish market and his connections to get uh, great seafood at the time, but uh, to get some uh, fresh herbs, uh, quality produce and vegetables yeah. was really, really uh, uh, difficult. Uh, it so, just wasn't the range that we and, and, and today we have a variety of, of produce that is amazing. Obviously the meat is good, the fish yeah. is good. I mean, uh, in New York we can cook with very, very high quality. Quality ingredients, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and just so Gilbert and Maggie were and Gilbert, and, Gilbert and Maggie were the sister and brother, and they created Le Bernardin in Paris, 1972, okay. in '86. And uh, Gilbert Le passed away in '94, and Maggie uh, is still uh, the owner and, yeah. at Le Bernardin. And has it always had uh, the seafood? Uh, uh, yes, focused, yeah. it was uh, yes always seafood focused because Grandpa was a fisherman. Yeah. Uh, the father was half of the time a fisherman, half of the time uh, a chef or hotelier in a small town in Brittany. And uh, it's only what they liked and knew what to do. Great. Okay, Michael. Um, so I introduced you as Michael the White of Morea, but you have 300 restaurants? No, restaurants not 300. We're at 13. <laughs> 13. At 13 right now. And uh, we have a couple projects for next year. But, uh, and can you talk about where you just came back from? I just came back from Istanbul. We just opened uh, in the Zorlu Center, which is a new mixed use building. Uh, in, in Istanbul, and it's host to uh, numerous different restaurants and then shopping and uh, a performing arts center and, and such. So it's, it's cool. quite unique to be uh, 8,000 kilometers away from home and having to go through all the different uh, things of product. I was just speaking with Chef before we went on camera about things we take for granted in sure. New York City and for all the viewers as well. Being able to go to the grocery store, and he was saying about herbs, those things just 20 years ago, 15 years ago, weren't a, a, the ability to get fresh basil and, right. and fresh bay leaves and all these kinds of things. And so going to a place like Istanbul, uh, 20 million inhabitants, it's very, very uh, frenetic and chaotic. Uh, but there are there is not double zero flour, so you're having to have flour milled for you. Right. There's a tremendous amount of ash in the flour, and so therefore it colors. So all these things that I'm learning on a daily basis, you know, trying to keep things together. You are obviously well, known known for your Italian food, king of the uh, great pastas. Pasta. Um, do you, when you're traveling, do you eat Italian wherever you are? Do you, do you check out the competition? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Avoid it. It's like you just eat fish outside of his restaurant, <laughs> right? No. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, both chef, both of us, uh, I, I can speak for him. We are not uh, snobbed when it comes to food. We, yeah. we can eat anything, just about anything, yeah. uh, and we like to. Uh, I tell you, if I have any more minced lamb. Uh, I've been having a lot of that, <laughs> so, but uh, no, I, I really tend to, to to eat the food of where I'm at, uh, and I think all chefs do that. We gravitate towards the flavors of uh, whatever place we're at. So yeah, do you have any do you have any tactics when you're traveling somewhere new? If you haven't been to Istanbul, do you go to the markets first, or do you research? Well, the I had Coca Rech the first night that I was there. Coca Rech are like spicy chitlins on toasted bread with lots of paprika. And oh, that sounds and good. It's nice. really good. the ultimate hangover food, I would say. But, but not uh, that you were. No, no absolutely not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
It's just a jet lag hangover sound. This is still drinking so water. Drinking water. <laughs> right here. Exactly. So, but uh, no, it's amazing what's going on. Yeah. All over the world, for that matter. And what, Eric, do you, when you're traveling, do you have tactics for do you research places? Do you just get out off the off the plane and start walking around? I, I, I always have friends where yeah. I travel, and um, I do a little bit of research, of course. Yeah. And uh, depending where I go, I start by the market. If it's the morning, I land in the afternoon. We go for a long night to kill the uh, to kill the jet lag. Yeah. And, 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 and then uh, the day after, start more uh, seriously to to go through the city. Or the, or but he's always going to the cool places, it's like Punta <laughs> del Este, Brazil, all these like yeah. cool places. Well, if you have choice, why why go to, <laughs> to Cleveland? I mean, nothing against Cleveland, but you know, you can go. Cleveland. Yeah. You can go to Bahia. Yeah, why not? go to Cleveland and do a show on Cleveland, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about each other. You obviously know each other. Uh, if you had to take a dish from the other's restaurant, wow. what would you what would you swipe from them? What would you would you would you give it your own spin, or what would you do with it? I have I have one that I really really love and wish I would have come up with. And I'm not jealous at all. Oh, come it's on. not my it's not seared, part of my the the, 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 the seared chin. With the lardo, that's, that's insane. my yeah, God, yeah, that yeah. that dish. Um, so for people in, who don't know what it gives is, you but... goosebumps, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. of pleasure when you eat that dish. And yeah. I was like, wow, I can't believe it. I remember the first did. night he ate it. He ate with a friend of ours as well at Maria, and uh, we were so nervous cooking for him because obviously the Bernadan is stalwart for seafood. And stuff, so. Don't order the seafood. Yeah, exactly. So it's tough for him to eat seafood elsewhere. So yeah. I think uh, when you gave me the food you gave me, it was amazing. Yeah. What about you, Michael? Yes. Yeah, so I tell you what, I'm going to tell you something that I don't know if he still makes it, but it's probably one of the things that is so reminiscent, reminiscent from my first time when I went to Le and that is the demi smoked salmon mousse that you know oh, yes. that you poach. Regular salmon in a white wine and herbs and such, and then you mix it with uh, chilled and then with uh, smoked salmon and then a little bit of mayonnaise and lemon and things. Yeah. Dishes like that are just uh, they're timeless. Yeah. Uh, they're extremely savory, crispy, smoky. Uh, so if you're not doing that, uh, no, we still <laughs> we still do it for lunch. We give it uh, as an amenity actually to everyone. Oh, oh nice. Yeah. Nice. So, uh, but it's kind of uh, it's a mousse kind of potted uh, potted salmon, if you will, yeah. made, but. But it's like the texture of a rillette. So exactly. Salmon rillette. Salmon rillette. Salmon rillette. Exactly. So uh, we're joking a little bit about sw uh, swiping each other's dishes, but talk about where you get inspiration. And are there dishes that you've done recently on either of your menus that you took from? Obviously, didn't take directly, but they used, you ate somewhere and you thought this is this directly inspired you to to do a riff on it. I mean, for for me, I, I'm a chef as well. Uh, travel uh, gives us the uh, input all the time, whether it's. Uh, you could be eating cilantro and different things, but there might be an aspect of that dish that say, "Oh, there's fried crispy garlic on that. Maybe I could use that in a certain way." So, right. for 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 myself, it's travel. Uh, whether it's going to Hong Kong, we have a restaurant in Hong Kong. Uh, just all the dumplings and all the different things. You might see a presentation that gives me inspiration. So, it can be from anywhere. It doesn't have to be Italian in in genre. Or fine dining. That's no, yeah. not at all. I mean, I usually seek out. Uh, the the hallmark of Italian food is very very much peasant cooking and uh, simplicity, and so therefore eating in a trattoria osteria I can get inspiration, and then it's obviously how we do it and a little bit more care done to it. Or it's in a in a genori plate. Uh, it's on it's on Central Park South, and therefore, you know that kind of thing. But it all comes from the the core the core core dishes. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Same for me. I mean, traveling is is very important. Uh, although in New York, I have to say we we're lucky because we live with so many different ethnicities in the same city. You travel just by getting and, the and we see so many different uh, ingredients and restaurants and, and inter interact with other chefs from other countries and so on. But ultimately, inspiration comes from our surroundings. Mm -hmm. And if if we happen to travel, I just come back from Korea, and lately I'm playing with all the ingredients and and I'm having fun in the kitchen. Um, and it's something is coming out slowly. Out of this experience, and I'm not saying Le Bernardin will be Korean no. uh, next week, but we will have some yeah, touches and, and, and flavors from it. But as I say, I, for those who have been to Le Bernardin uh, times and, and have been uh, the time through his career, it's really amazing how he. he I'm speaking, uh, <laughs> no, but in the sense that you know he might go to Puerto Rico or the, when his book came out, and and different types of. So it's really interesting to see the evolution of Le Bernardin. Um, 
he has, is, is a bit more fortunate in the sense that I have an Italian box to cook right. inside of, oh, and it goes all the way to the tippy-tippy top of Alto Adige, so it could be Spetsly and things like that, and then all the way down to Sicily where there is couscous and African, North African, Norman influences, so I have a pretty big box, but he, he has the ability and uh, obviously uh, the want and desire to keep doing, so it, it's, I, I, I'm jealous in some, because he'll be doing something like, I Tell me, give me a. No, don't be jealous. Ancho <laughs> chili yeah, or something. You, know. in <laughs> you can cook meat. I'm stuck with the fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's it's give and take. But I mean, yeah. we both. Uh, I mean, keeping keeping on the the subject of inspiration, are there? Do you find do each of you find yourself more inspired by uh, fine dining dishes, fine dining experiences, high level things, or you're out on the street and you there's a flavor combination at a street stall, or you're in Istanbul? Well, it's gonna be no chitlin dishes anytime yeah. soon. But I mean, you can yeah. do it. Uh, <laughs> take. Um, I'll lead the chef. I mean, yeah. please. It's no, I mean, inspiration is something that you cannot control. And it comes anytime it wants. Sometimes you can be walking in the market and sometimes be not so inspired and right. sometimes be extremely inspired. I find myself very inspired when I am in a plane doing nothing. I'm stuck. Not eating plane food. And, and no, nobody not, can talk to you. No, but you know, <laughs> suddenly I have ideas and, yeah. and I have a remembrance of my, of my trip and so on. So. Um, fine dining, of course, inspire me, and and uh, eating in markets or in small restaurants or even in the house of someone yeah. can inspire me. So inspiration, the beauty of it is that you, you don't control it; it comes whenever it wants. Right. What you have to learn is how to manage the inspiration and right. and keep it all year long. Right. And 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 I don't know if anybody got to see some of the tweets that he did when he was in Korea, but I mean, showing the food and the different things. I mean, it's amazing to think that. You'll see nuances. Like, for example, I have a restaurant in Hong Kong, and we went to, to the New Territories to eat uh, in a restaurant the last time I was there, and there was sautéed calamari, and there was broccoli, and there was like a little anchovy paste. Well, all of a sudden, you start thinking that garlic, chili, anchovy yeah. to make broccoli rabe in Italian. So it's really interesting. The more that I get to travel, and I'm sure uh, Eric can, can say the same, is that you'll start to see things that kind of are core the correlation of different dishes and things like that. Right. So it's what gives us the impetus or me the inspiration to keep doing new things. But nothing's new. It's just how it's placed on the plate or, or you know making it our food. Right. Right. Cool. Um, so I thought maybe we'd open it up to one of our readers. Uh, Crystal, do you want to go ahead and lead us off? Hey there. Um, I was wondering if you two were to open a restaurant together, how would you merge your styles and do you think it would be difficult or easy to do that? And can I get a reservation? Yeah, you wouldn't be able to get in probably. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a good uh, team player and I, like, I, I love to delegate and share. So I think we will get along well. Definitely. Um, we have the same passion and for seafood, obviously, with Maria, what you have done is, is, is amazing. Uh, I don't master the pasta the way Michael must, he masters has a, the pasta. He's a good caviar quail egg dish. <laughs> I saw a lobster lasagna, too, yesterday somewhere on okay, fine. So okay. I was going to say, like, if you want to brush up a little bit on that. So. <laughs> Ultimately, I think we will find, we will find a way to, um, to work Definitely. together. It, it's... It, we, it's yeah. not that difficult because we no. do it already with our team Definitely. and with our uh, talented uh, chefs and sous chefs. And that was the other question we, we mentioned, we didn't mention. We get a lot of inspiration from our team members as well. I mean, right. Eric and myself, uh, Eric's had people that have been with him for 20 plus years. I mean, I've, I'm at the 14, 15 year mark here in New York, so uh, it's, we get inspiration from our people as well. Yeah. But I think I would, if it was going to be a seafood restaurant, obviously, he would. I would definitely do the pasta section, okay? I would do the pasta <laughs> and if it's not a seafood restaurant, I'm not taking the steak. <laughs> no, meat on, no meat for me. Yeah. You could, I've seen you cook on the plancha. Yeah, I like to cook it. steak yeah. uh, for fun. Yeah. Uh, no, but but uh, I mean, I, I'm really specialized in seafood, and uh, uh, not like I don't know how to cook meat. Obviously, uh, I, I learn through my career how to cook sure. meat, but I think we will find. Uh, um, Complimentary. Definitely. Oh, exactly. absolutely. I think you know many times how the you know the golfers play together as a team, like European, and it, right. I think it'd be really uh, great to to have a squad of. Uh, we have a strategy. Oh, yeah, like absolutely. Strong strategy. Yeah. And, like, and I'll tell you the reason why we would because. Um, as chefs, we have all uh, started and still working to master how to do numbers. Uh, he grew up in Europe, and I was worked in Europe, and we never do anywhere the numbers that we do. So we're producing food 
um, for larger groups of people right. and in a certain way with method and technique. And having those capabilities, we would, as a, t you know, if you took five guys from, Chicago, uh, from here from New York City, we'd go against anybody and, because <laughs> we know how to because people want to eat between 7 o'clock and 9 right. o'clock at night. And, yeah. and, and, uh, You're talking about the New York diner, the expectations are at a certain level or the, just the city everywhere, itself? But I'm just, it? you know, most restaurants in Europe uh, is open at 8 o'clock and right. closes at 10 o'clock. So right. there's one seating where we're yeah. massive three seating yeah. restaurants and scale. private party going on at the same time. So in order to do that kind of food, you have to become... Uh, uh, crafty and ingenuity, you know, ingenuity to, to do things in a certain way. So. Also, the good news is that we have, I think, the same passion for great products. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, seafood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, f for Michael and for myself, the, the fish is the star of the plate. And that is already uh, a philosophy that we share together, and that helps a lot. Um, Product in a relationship in the kitchen, yeah. we have to be together. Here we get, yeah. Um, great, that was a great question. It ain't happening anytime soon, okay? <laughs> so we're a little busy. No rumors, sorry. Yeah. Uh, unless we come up with a great name for it. All right. So we'll think of it. Um, all right, so let's, let's ask another uh, reader. Uh, Christy, do you have a question for Eric and Michael? Yes, hello, chefs. Um, you're hello. both such great chefs and restaurateurs. What do you think is the secret to such a great dining out experience? Wow. The secret, I'm sorry. Uh, the secret to, to dining, to dining, dining out. experience. From, from the diner's secret. point of view? From the... Um, yes, like what, what makes, as a diner, what makes an experience so great? What, what do you think that we should be looking for? Ah, well, if I, if I may start, um, in restaurants, every night we see an entire dining room of, of people looking for the right experience. And what you are looking for may be different than the next table. Some people come for an anniversary, a birthday, celebration. Some people are uh, in business. And uh, what they are focused on is signing the deal at the end of the dinner. Um, many clients come to enjoy the food. Some other people come for the, the holistic experience that is the service, the food, uh, and the decor. Uh, so it, uh, it's our role, in a sense, or through our waiters who are, who are reading the, basically the mind of the, of the clients to uh, adapt and de and deliver that experience that you potentially are, are looking for. Definitely, definitely. And it's it's the people, uh, it's our employees. You know mm -hmm. that that uh, it's multifaceted in the sense that uh, uh, we are both uh, uh, so focused on the details. Uh, perfection, we it's hard to arrive at perfection, but details are really what we're after. So the music and uh, uh, lighting. the lighting. And there's so many. The question that you ask, we could talk for hours about. Um, it's a great question. But uh, how how uh, one arrives at the kind of restaurants that we do? I mean, um, it's just the people. There's a at Marea. There's 149 employees at Marea, and we're open for lunch and dinner. So add one more, it'd be 150. Yeah, 150. I'm um, sure there's the same amount at. Uh, we have the same actually. Really? Yeah, yeah, we have about 150. Yeah. 150. 150. Um, but it it brings up an interesting point, which is that all restaurant experiences are never just about the food. That it's that it's this 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 full experience it's, it's this this thing and it's different for each each diner so there's no one perfect meal because every everyone's expectations and needs and our, our desires and tastes yes. and this should be and so how people eat you know, at restaurants for sustenance right <laughs> <laughs> that, you know some so people so come yeah. it's cold outside they <laughs> <laughs> see the light <laughs> I'm joking but how how do you engineer that experience for I mean I know there's no quick and easy answer but how do you, how do you how do you make a restaurant work for all these different uh, all these different diners? Through training, yeah, uh, training and and sharing our passion and our vision with the staff, and uh, and the team um, if they if they are loyal and and stay with us, which is the case. I mean, at Maria, I see the same employees since you opened. They won't and, leave. And, 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 and <laughs> we don't want us, to. <laughs> we, suddenly we are we are thinking the same. Right. And it's all about the, the the client, what they're looking for. Right. Uh, not necessarily pleasing them with uh, steak well done at Le Bernardin. It's right. not, not what I'm talking about, but pleasing them in a sense that we they have to read again the mind of the client and 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 see what they are looking for and and then help us uh, and, and and have and the entire team. Adapt it creating to the experience to that person. And, and he said the, the C word, which is the best, it's all about the client. Right. The client is, we, we do not build restaurants for 
uh, any other purpose than to for our clients. Right. Because the client is who comes to your restaurant and frequents the restaurant, and if they're not happy in it, or if we don't provide them, or as he was saying, the body language of the server, they're trying to cut the million dollar deal. Right. You know, stand um, back just and stand not back. tell the story of I mean, where the scallop came from. Very, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's not, he, he doesn't care. Right. Or she does not yeah. care. And so uh, let's talk about it from the client's point of view. When you guys are the clients, when you're dining out in each other's restaurants or you go out to dinner, let's talk uh, sort of din dining out tactics. What, do you go in and do you order what the restaurant is known for? Do you, do you order specials? Do you stay away from specials? Do you look for things that are, remind you of something you know and see how they riff on it? What's, what's your approach to it? Well, if I go to Michael's place, if I go to Marea, yeah. I'll let them do the menu. You do, the, just because sit back. Because they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy. Yeah. Um, well, let's say you go somewhere where you're not going to get you that. Know, you know, I lose my sixth sense. Yeah. Depending where I am, I'm looking at it and at the place, and I'm like, hmm, maybe the special is not a good idea yeah. uh, here. <laughs> That's uh, a big maybe, misnomer. Maybe <laughs> it should be conservative. Stay away from the specials. Sometimes yeah. very adventurous. Uh, yeah. It, 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 it all depends where I am, and uh, but I have to say, as chefs, we are very lucky. Each time we go somewhere, we are very uh, spoiled and pampered. And, right, right, right. And, and that's the other thing. I think when when I want to go out with my wife and my child, he does the same thing. Uh, we like to go to restaurants that don't know who we are as well, yeah. because we can just get in and get out. You don't want to get killed every yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. So we, nice I find myself going to ethnic restaurants or something like that, that's or random restaurant. restaurants. Uh, number one for great food, but number number two, which is a big bonus, is is that uh, uh, kind of incognito. Just to be a diner, yeah. yeah. Now you, Michael, you said something about uh, that uh, specials were a misnomer. Do you? Is that well, a... it, it, we always say if you're going to do a special, it has to be special. Yeah. Here yeah. lies the word special. So right. I think a lot of times specials uh, become oh I have too many <laughs> too much rack of lamb and so right. I'm going to do it in a different way or something. It's going on. Doesn't tomorrow. mean that it's spoiled, but uh, I really encourage all the people in the kitchen to if you're going to do something special, then you better make it special. So, so you don't do, you don't avoid it, but you just sort of look no, at it and absolutely. see if it oh. if it lives up to that that, that uh, definition. Yeah, actually at the, at the Bernardin we don't have a special because. I mean, my reasoning behind it is that I cannot come up, or the team cannot come up with 365 great ideas. Right. No, you can't. it takes a long time to create a very good dish. So um, the, the specials at, at Bernardin are all, almost non-existent. Yeah. Except if today, I mean, actually today we receive some best scallops that are amazing. So we're going to do something special with it. But it's it's an anomaly. So for short term exactly, and, and be, yeah. especially at Marais, at Bernadette, obviously a restaurant that where there's frequent diners, you right. you need to keep it exciting. So at the Butterfly Club, for example, we're doing specials there. Um, but great ideas for every twenty things that we put on on the for me, one sticks on the menu. Do you do you view More specials as a kind of testing ground for new ideas or? Well, we, we encourage the team members to to um, white asparagus are in season or white truffles or we're doing something like that. Yeah. Then each and every person will like work on something for a while right. and then we'll bring it together as a cohesive group. I mean, um, that's something I've definitely learned from you know working for years that uh, although we have very good ideas, it's better to have uh, more more ideas sure. on the plate. Collaboration. So, definitely. So, all right, let's, uh, we have another reader out there. Mira, do you want to yeah. ask a question of the chefs? Yeah, I was Mira. wondering, uh, what do you like to cook at home? And do you bring ideas from the restaurant home? And inversely, do you play with something at home and bring it into the restaurant? Mm. Or is there someone else in charge of the kitchen at home? <laughs> um, no, one, no one is in charge of the kitchen at home. <laughs> and uh, my wife doesn't really like to cook. Um, she likes to make breakfast, which is a blessing because I, I, I'm, I wake up late. Uh, however, f um, during the week I am at the restaurant, so then I don't have to take care of the kitchen. But on the weekend, um, we go out one night, and on Sunday I'm, I'm the chef of the kitchen. Um, so I'm cooking. Uh, but the food that I make is home food. It's not like from Le Bernardin, and uh, it's, it's not as... as Refine and it's it's not so many details, but it's more it's more like um, like right now I'm making stews at home yeah, because the, gonna say. because it's cold and the season is is uh, making us want to have something rich and hot and warming us up. Uh, so uh, this weekend probably I'm gonna do a coco vin or something like that. Sure. Nice. Sure. These one pot meals exactly like in a la Crusade pot. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Dripping. And so that's, satisfying. That's definitely. 
That's right. And it, it absolutely fills the home with the beautiful... Uh, I love the aroma. Your aroma. Yeah. Exactly. It's and then everybody comes home and they're like, oh, we can't wait to eat. So <laughs> it, it's, it's rewarding, but um, cooking on a regular basis is like asking a postman if he goes for a walk when he gets home from work. So <laughs> we, don't, uh, we don't do that, okay? So. <laughs> is it hard to be a, a chef uh, in other people's houses? Do they get nervous? They tell you always, Most I hope this is okay. Or... Yeah, it's terrible. We, I feel bad about it. I mean, you know. That's why we don't go out to anyone's house. Nobody, nobody invites nobody us. Nobody us ever. Right. Oh. All right. Mira, Mira can yeah. invite you over. Nice. I haven't had that invite yet. Just yeah. so. All right. Uh, Jonathan, do you want to uh, ask a question of the chefs? Hi, chefs. Thanks for taking my question. I was wondering, outside of New York, what are your favorite uh, culinary cities in the United States? And then as a follow-up to that, uh, what's one must-try restaurant in that city? Okay. Um, should, we, should we set a ground rule that they can't pick New York? Did you say outside yeah, of New York? No, no. Why can't no, we pick New York? That's too easy. Um, <laughs> they'll pick their own restaurants. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, we know the, the cities that have a lot of uh, passion about cooking, and, and the obvious is San Francisco, for instance, or Chicago. But today in, in the U.S., we, we, can, we kind of see a renaissance and, and almost like a, a food revolution with a lot of chefs in many, many cities who are creating uh, great restaurants and, and, and meals and dishes. You can go to Austin, Texas, and, uh, and it's great food. And, and uh, you can go today to Washington, D.C. 20 years ago was so boring. Yeah. But today, Washington, D.C. with Jose Andres and all those chefs is, is bubbling and, and so on. So it's, uh, it's difficult to mention one restaurant because it will be very unfair for the other ones, I, I think. I, I, one of my favorite food cities uh, is right now Hong Kong. I mean, uh, it's uh, um, the, it's it's food sensory overload. So I, I would definitely say that's high on my list right now. Uh, you can have dim sum. I mean, you can have that the, the, the dumplings. Uh, they, right. It starts in the morning. Like I'm not a sweet person in the morning, so I'm I'm a good dis good disposition. But I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> but the coffee, you know, the coffee. But there I can start with like a bowl of noodles or something like. It's right. just oh, amazing, you know, yeah. for me as possibly being passionate about pasta, but uh, to be able to have a bowl of noodles or something like that in the morning is amazing. So. Any, any city in the States you've been to for the first time recently and, and were surprised by the quality of restaurants there? Um, you know, uh, Eric said Austin. I mean, Austin, I'm a yeah. barbecue guy. Yeah. I love just a part barbecue, though, but there's amazing food being cooked there. Austin's a great food city. You can um, have a great sushi restaurant. Yeah, the, I've Tell me the name, though. I forgot the name. I forgot the name. Yeah. It was the cookbook, and I went there. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's very good. That's the beauty about what's happened, obviously. Tasting table, all the things. I mean, we have five, six, uh, six people here asking us questions. Right. Food is everywhere right now. Right. And so that is not just in New York, not just in Chicago, but we're talking about Atlanta and uh, Austin and different and feeder Vegas. cities, Vegas, Vegas. Yeah. The, the, where you can get really, really fantastic food. Yeah, so it's an interesting it, this time. This all is good for everybody. With people, yeah, you have people in New York. Dying to go to Charleston, dying to go to, yeah. to Austin. Absolutely. To, I feel like that is something that's changed in time. It's changed in the last 10, 15 years. And and we are, we travel so much. I mean, you were mentioning Asia, but you go to Tokyo and and you're so overwhelmed yeah. by by the quality of the food and the different experience that yeah. you can have and so on. It's, the depth it's, of the cuisine. It's very the inspiring. Korea, the Kalbe, the Oboki. Oh, yes. yeah, it's just uh, amazing. Do you travel ever specifically to get? Do you go to a region of, or an area of Italy you haven't been to or you haven't been to in a while? I've, I've done every region in Italy, so I've done my doctorate, <laughs> but uh, I've done every region. Um, the answer is the answer is no. I, 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 wherever I find myself, I could be in the south of France. Uh, yeah. I could be anywhere and think about. Um, but they're food. not trips, just to not like trips. I've got to go. No, I usually like connect a trip though. So if I go to Hong Kong for a week to work in the restaurant, then I'll go to Chiang Mai for a couple of days. You know that kind of thing because food. You know that's just an amazing experience. Why else would you get on a plane? Sure. Yeah, you're that far. So to, in order to make yeah, just most of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we've got one more uh, reader out there. Alyssa, do you want to have a question for these guys? Uh, yeah, Eric. If you hosted a table for two at your restaurant, what two people, dead or alive? Would you want in for dinner, and what would you serve oh. them? Would they be dead at the dinner? Or? <laughs> I hope wow. not. No, just, okay. You know, alive, but they could be dead or alive. <laughs> um, I would, I would like to have my father, uh, mm -hmm. because because unfortunately he passed away when I was very young, and um, 
I would like to have uh, the Dalai Lama because I'm a, I'm a follower and um, actually we cook once for him. We closed the restaurant and we, close, we, we cooked for him. But I will cook for them um, in respect for the Dalai Lama, uh, a vegetarian uh, a meal. And I will do my best to make it taste like fish. <laughs> <laughs> Get some umami in there, some flavor, some the mouth. Uh, all right, I think we've uh, winding down a bit. Time for last couple questions. Um, so we're talking about each other's restaurants, we're talking about restaurants out there. Talk about you brag a little bit. Talk about your own stuff. What are, if someone's coming to one of your restaurants? It doesn't have to be Maria. What's one dish you 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 want them to try, just so they get they get a sense of your your style of? Cooking? It doesn't have to be Maria. It doesn't have to I be. Mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm very proud of all the restaurants. Sure, we, I know it's we, possible. Well, to in the one, sense, but. Um, listen at the Butterfly Cove right now. The patty melts pretty That's solid hot, yeah. right now. It's a it's a dish that you know from my childhood in the Midwest, and and we're using an aged blend of meat with it and. Good patty bit. melt weather too. Yeah, it's right good now. patty melt weather. Um, I, I have to tell you, the, the, probably the f my my favorite, most comforting kind of food, other than pastas in the various restaurants and such, is is having the pizza that I, that we make at Nicoletta, which is this childhood experience. Each and every one of us knows the pizzeria that when they walked into as a young person, it smells like dry oregano and tomato and cheese, and you have that sensory memory with you. And so every time I go to Nicoletta, I I, I have that. You know, feeling, and we're applying method and technique to it. And now, I used to work in a pizzeria that we didn't use a starter or things like that. So we're adding flavor to it, and we're building. So I'm very, very proud of that. Very proud of it. Both those things making me hungry to hear about. Yeah. Eric, what about you? And if uh, someone walks into Le Bernardin first time, well, I think the carpaccio of tuna that we have with the foie gras underneath and the toasted baguette is a must because it's um, it's a it, it's a good ambassador of the style. Yeah. Um, it looks very, very simple, and uh, yet very flavorful, and it, it elevates also the qualities of the tuna. And uh, I think it's a, a signature dish that represents us very well, and that someone should have. The white tuna with the bordelais. I mean, there, it can, yeah, the list yeah. can go on here. Yeah. But thank you. Silver <laughs> salt. Um, all right. Well, this has been great. I think we need to wrap it up, unfortunately. But uh, thank you both, chefs, for coming uh, to hang out with us today. And thank you, participants and readers, for thank you very much. having great thank questions. You. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for watching uh, Table for Two, presented by City Thank You Preferred Card and Tasting Table. If you're not signed up for Tasting Table, as now I get to plug this. If you're not signed up for Tasting Table already, please sign up at tastingtable.com slash join. And next time you're out at about at either of these gentlemen's restaurants or anywhere else, uh, use your City Thank You Preferred Card and earn two times the points on your next, next restaurant experience. <laughs>